Food justice, what's it look like? This week, where do we begin to think about food? Is it with how we grow it, or how we eat it, or who has access to the stuff of life? Food is as political as it gets, as you'll see. Today, we'll hear from some of the farmers, organizers, workers, and seed keepers who attended this fall's meeting of the Northeast Sustainable Agricultural Working Group, and we'll talk with, among others, Leah Penniman of Soul Fire Farm, whose new book, Farming While Black, is out now. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The conference and, uh, is a place uh, where people can come together and see each other in person. There's a kind of magic that happens when people are face to face as opposed to being on the phone or over email. Our stakeholders are very diverse from producers to people working on food access and consumption and everyone in between, the whole food system. A lot of people within that system are often at odds or in direct um, hostility towards each other. And so we're trying to help people have conversations outside of this really polarized context that we find ourselves in lately. We also use it as a way to lift up the work happening in a particular city or community and give those uh, stakeholders an opportunity to showcase what they're doing. So that's why we had the urban farm tour earlier today. All right, so welcome to the farm. Come on in. We practice here what's called natural agriculture. I want everyone to try it on. Say natural agriculture. Natural. Sankofa Farm was uh, initiated I guess now it's been eight, going into our eighth year. Sankofa uh, is from an Akan phrase, which means there's nothing wrong with going back and fetching what you left behind. This community garden features beds, and each bed you see represents at least one, maybe more families uh, in the neighborhood. I restricted to Southwest Philadelphia for the most part. Seed keeping very much follows in line with the idea behind Sankofa in that when we're keeping seeds, we're keeping um, pieces of our ancestors. Um, we're kind of giving um, respect to those that came before us, looking back into time. But we're also looking forward. True Love Seeds is a seed company, um, and we focus on preserving culturally important seeds to the farmers that grow them. Um, and we collaborate with farmers across the country who are keeping seeds of their place and of their communities and of their ancestors. The seeds are, in many cases, what we have left of some of the most important aspects of our culture. Having a tangible and consumable and replicable piece of who we are and who our ancestors are means really to the world to a people who have been repeatedly dispossessed and repeatedly moved around. Seed keeping is keeping the physical seed, but it's also really, really holding the story and holding the power around it and that takes people and that takes continuity and I think particularly in my experience in the north many African Americans have lost that connection because our elders haven't talked about it um, or we've just become too busy and distracted with another form of life and I think we're seeing the devastating results of that disconnection both from our spiritual practice and from our cultural traditions which are absolutely dependent on our food and our old folks. It feels really important to me that the food movement, which has, I think for a lot of people, traditionally been the province of white privileged people who can afford to eat organic, local, expensive food, we really want to shift the focus away from that and towards, you know, eliminating food apartheid, making sure that people who we're supporting the people who are most impacted by these issues and not patronizing them by telling them how they ought to eat or assuming they don't know how to make good decisions for themselves. Really addressing inequality and inequity. We're not trying to save people. We're trying to support work led by people who are really struggling the most in this current time that we're all in. The main uh, constituency that we work with are 
modestly paid or sometimes unpaid activists who work at the micro community level. And so just having an opportunity for them to really talk about what they're doing and meet other people, we feel is so important to the kind of food systems work we're trying to lift up and move forward. So we are in the middle of West Philadelphia, in the middle of a very marginalized community. And One Art is somewhat of an island in the middle of that. So sometimes I describe this as an eco arts village. It's a community space. It's a space for healing. Um, it's a space for art programming and it's a space for growing food. So our goal is to be 100% sustainable and we want to show people of color coming together and creating community, a sustainable community together. We also want to take the model that we're creating here and just bring it to as many places within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. as possible. This was going to be an earth ship. And um, if you don't know about Earthships, really cool, 100% sustainable, completely off the grid. Everything, including the waste, is processed throughout the house. So you're literally. So we have multiple classes that happen weekly, and um, again, everything's geared, geared towards healing. But we don't limit what types of classes that we have, as long as it's positive and uplifting. We work with the communities. If we have a teacher who wants to teach martial arts, then we're teaching martial arts. Um, and so we have a diverse programming happening during the week. We also will have workshops during, you know, over a weekend period of time. And then we also do a lot of events um, in our outdoor space as well as our indoor spaces. Creating safe space is really important and what we find is that people are just, um, they're brought in together and they, uh, you know, we don't do a lot of marketing at all. People just come because they know that, or they've heard they're going to experience something wonderful here. The activists at NISOG are also about changing policy. Later in the day, we followed many of them down to City Hall for a Save Our Gardens rally demanding an end to the eviction of urban farmers and a transparent use of public land. Um, over the last two years, about a year and a half ago, we started seeing a lot of our gardens being pushed into sheriff's cell. So what we understood is that there's already an issue with our gardeners not, who not generally, like I, I, I would say about roughly 80% of our, our gardens and farms in that city are, are insecure, which means that they don't have legal access to the land, right? So they be, might be on the land without permission, they may have a lease or a license, but they don't have actual legal, um, they don't have legal permission to be there, right? And what happened in this city, because gentrification picked up, development picked up the last two years, places where folks have been gardening for over sometimes 30 years are being pushed into sheriff's cell, when that, that has not been a problem before. We, we knew that we had to do something to, um, to stop that. We want you, we're going to hear some stories about some folks who have lost their land, some folks whose land is constantly threatened, and also some folks who, who just want to be down, who understand the cause and are down, right? So we're going to give them an ear for a little while, listen to some stories, and give them a lot of love, all right? And this year, our like land bank, the land bank we have here, um, I guess it's been up, for, up and running for about four or five years now. It's been running maybe for three years now. And it was supposed to be, it was um, held as this, you know, this community, br this bridge between community and the city, right? So we, the, because land relationships between the city and the community have been for a long time really bad. And so the land bank was supposed to be this thing that came in and it was going to, you know, solve all the problems. So what we're seeing is that when this is supposed to be, because based on the law, this should be a transparent process, we're not, we're not, we don't know who the land is going to. There, there is land apparently going through the land bank, but it's definitely not going to the folks that, that I know have been asking about it. So we know that we have to fight the land bank until they start responding to us. We appreciate the fact that we have a land bank if the land bank will work for us, right? You know, I think one of the reasons that we found this action to be really important is because 
there really isn't a way of getting a temperature test of how council people or people in power feel about urban agriculture. You know how people feel about gun control, you know how people feel about women's rights, but urban agriculture isn't being taken seriously as a political act of resistance, right, and resilience. When folks think that urban ag has a white face and it's a hobby, right, that does a disservice to all of the communities that have started urban gardens as an act of resilience and a way to feed themselves and a way to support themselves. And so this has also been an opportunity for us to um, shape right, the urban ag narrative mm. to represent our own communities so that folks can understand that urban agriculture is not a hobby, it is an act of resilience. And it always has been. So like the reality of this movement is, is that it's shining light on the fact that people have been growing food in, in, in cities and in urban spaces for decades, right? And a lot of those people look like me and a lot of people look like you because that is, and that's how it's always been. And so because very recently white folks have got more involved in doing the thing, all of a sudden there's a white face on what's happening. Mm -hmm. We, but we've been effectively changing that narrative within the city here, which has been a great boon for us, I think, and for the growers. And let's hope that our city council listens to that. So what's involved in making this sort of change and who is taking part? We had a chance to sit down with some of the organizers at NISAG who are working on food justice across the country and ask them about the many forms this work is taking. So I think that imbalances of power and people feeling powerless has impacted the imagination of every individual that has been colonized on this planet. And we have to dig, we have to dig through those layers. Somebody put forward an idea that said, we will make more profits if we do things this way, and may have considered and didn't care, or may have not considered the repercussions of that choice to put profits over people. It's not, that is not a thing that is made up. It's a lived experience, and it's a critique and analysis, and an accurate analysis of the way that this system fails. So with regards to art, it frees up space and it lets you drop off some of the experiences of trauma and some of the horror of the things that have hurt you to imagine something different. Racism is um, runs very deep in, in this work. So decolonizing the food system and the future of food is really what we're willing to do to decolonize our own practices and the future of us. The story of the future of food is the future of us. Well, many people, many people in our generation, they care deeply about food. And sometimes I see mostly youth of color that care more about food because they have experienced food insecurity. They, they may be, or they have been in food reduced lunch, or they have been had to use food stamps. And they get more impacted to this need to connect with the land and the new landscape because they may be from minority groups or from an immigrant background like myself. Um, most immigrants, their first job when they land into this country is in the food system. So it's like we, we have so much power in the industry and so much labor force that we bring into the food system. So I just want some visibility. Like we are an important part of this system and we want to be part of those conversations. We want to be stakeholders. We are not just consumer power. We also have decision making power. Our county is, um, every single student qualifies for the free and reduced meals. So our poverty rate is really high in Morgan County. Um, so for us, it's trying to figure out how we can get local food and healthier foods to our students, to our families that are at that low income level. Um, that's really one of our main focuses right now. And education and trying to work on policy around all of it so that we can get um, people at that poverty level the food they need. For me, it was really gratifying when I had to teach uh, K to 12 kids about where food comes from, mostly from urban areas. And something that we make a decision is that sometimes kids will call the ground the floor and not like ground or soil. And that's when we see a huge disconnect 
that many people don't know where their food is coming from. I think that most people people see food as something so menial, something so insignificant when it nurtures our bodies and is such an important part of our, our economy, important parts of our lives. We set out in uh, late spring on a two-month tour of primarily rural communities. And the purpose of the tour was for me, uh, in my new role, to get to meet some of the members of the National Family Farm Coalition and to get reacquainted with those we work with at the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance. We visited 67 communities. We traveled about 13,000 miles. We're told that rural communities are the enemy of urban communities, that they are the places where uh, people who don't see everybody else as equal live. And so we, th this idea that these two parts of our society are separate, are so separate, are so different from each other, is another way to keep us apart. And so I just want to encourage those who have preconceived notions around what anybody feels or thinks about, whether they live in middle of New York City or in the middle of Iowa to suspend that because if you don't then we're setting up more of what we're experiencing right now. We need to let go of those assumptions in order to really make the systemic changes that we need to make and organize in a way that truly does build power and builds a broader base for the changes we want to see because they're not that different than the changes rural communities want to see. Right now we're in a moment where people are really hungry to address this question of inequality. I think for us, we just start from the basic notion that food is a basic human right and we all deserve access to the same quality of food regardless of all of those other things that impact how we came into this world. Leah Penniman's book is dedicated to the African ancestors who, before being forced onto slave ships, braided seeds into their hair. That alone tells you how deep, albeit traumatic, the history of much American agriculture is and how resilient the people who made it flourish. Yet, the story of food and farming in the U.S. is not just one of neglect and extraction. It is also one of wisdom and liberation with practices that have intricate cultural roots. Leah is returning to the show with a new book, Farming While Black, with stories and applications that have her community at their center. She's the co-director of Soul Fire Farm, which we featured on the show back in 2015. Welcome back. I should say you haven't been in studio before, but now we get to see you not in the fields, not in Willie Boots. We're glad to have you. I know, there's no mud on me at all today. <laughs> Your book, and I should say the subtitle is gorgeous because it is a practical guide. Soul Fire Farm's Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land is dedicated to those ancestral grandmothers. Um, you want to tell us more about that and why you start that way? Just that dedication stopped me in my tracks. Mm. Well, the family story goes that our grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, and many of the women in the community of the Dahomey region of West Africa, when everyone around them was being kidnapped and rounded up and they faced an uncertain future, they made a choice that astounds me uh, even in this moment. They decided to take the okra, the millet, the black rice, the cow peas that their families had saved for generations and to hide them in, the, in their braids because they didn't know where they were going, but they believed against odds in a future on soil, and they believed in us, that we would exist, and that they needed a legacy to pass on. And the reason I wanted to put that dedication forth is because in these challenging times, it's very easy to give up, to lose hope, just put Netflix on and chill, right? And I, and I have to be reminded that if they didn't give up on us, then who are we? in much less dire circumstances to give up on our descendants. It's that act of creative bringing into being, which you must have done too. I mean, you didn't get born with this farm. No, definitely didn't. I was, didn't even grow up on a farm. I started farming when I was 16 years old. I got a job at the Food Project in Boston, Mass, because I needed a job. And I have to tell you, from that first moment of planting a carrot seed and seeing it all the way through to maturity, and then chopping it up and serving it in a soup kitchen, I had found my way home. Yeah. Because being a rural, mixed black kid, very, very challenging to figure out who I was, whether I even merited being on this earth. And there was an elegant simplicity 
in the growing, the harvest, the sharing with community that whetted my passion for environmental stewardship and my concern for social welfare into this one sacred act. Mm. So I was totally hooked. I've been farming over 20 years. Uh, you know, Soul Fire, my husband and I joke that it's our third child because we give it at least as much love and time and attention as our two teenage children, Nishima and Emmett. And the land, how did it come into your care? Long story short, you know, we had a lot of trouble feeding our own children healthy food. Despite our college degrees, despite our knowledge of farming, you know, we had to walk over two miles to the nearest place to get fresh food. And our neighbors, when they found out we knew how to farm, there was a clamor. You, know, you need to start a farm for the people. I'll join. I'll be a customer. I want to visit. And so this vision was really a community vision. Mm -hmm. You know, we always had a long view that we'd get land, but it was accelerated by this encouragement. And having very little savings and wanting to be close to Albany, we essentially purchased a piece of a mountainside that was completely eroded. You know, the neighbors around us shook their heads like you cannot grow vegetables on this land. But we'd come from urban farming where you have to build up because there's lead in the soil. Mm -hmm. And we use a lot of those same techniques, which I later learned are African heritage techniques, to replenish the topsoil, to call the pollinators back in, to call the organic matter back in. And after about four years of building soil, you know, we were able to open our farm and, and have incredible produce. We feed over 300 individuals every week with a doorstep delivery program in the Capital District. It wasn't just you. This distancing from the land and from healthy food is pandemic mm -hmm. across the United States. Uh, and there was a report not so long ago from the Southern Poverty Law Center that was pretty dire in terms mm -hmm. of what people's relationship is to the land. How would you describe the problem that Soul Fire Farm is um, being the answer to? Oh my, well, it's just a tiny problem, <laughs> yeah. which is that our mission is to end racism and injustice in the food system. It concentrates the land, the power, the food into the hands of a few, and sadly, mostly European heritage folks. You know, 95% of the land is owned by white people. Um, if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket in your neighborhood. You're less likely to have diabetes or heart disease. Um, if you're a farm worker, you're not protected under the same laws as, as other workers in America. And so we have this institutionalized racism just baked in to the system, and it's invisible to a lot of us on the day-to-day. -day. So at Soul Fire, our small part is number one, steward the land the way our ancestors did and feed the people. Number two is to provide culturally relevant farm-based education for folks who want to take leadership in the food system. And the third thing is to be rabble rousers and, and change policy and change the way resources are distributed so that we have the means of production mm. to make lives on land. So you have a lot of tools in the book as well as a lot of um, history and writing. Um, what will people find in it in terms of things they can learn how to do? Well, I'm a super science nerd, so you can find all those things. Everything from vermicomposting to seed saving, if you want to know how to create a microfinance enterprise or a youth program, all the things we've learned at Soul Fire, we've tried to include, so we're not gatekeepers of the knowledge. So that's one braid, it's all this practical knowledge, right? And then another braid is the story of Soul Fire, which I tried to make fun and funny as it goes through all the mistakes we made, really raw and honest. And the third thing, which is where my heart swells, because I really believed as a young person going to all these totally white farming conferences that I did not belong, yeah. right? And as I was doing research for the book, I found out that quite literally every sustainable agriculture practice that I'd been exposed to had Afro-Indigenous roots. From Cleopatra's worms to George Washington Carver's cow peas, bringing nitrogen into the soil, to the polycultures of West Africa, I mean, it's all there. And so the third strand of this book is uplifting those stories and restoring our dignity in that narrative of sustainable agriculture. There is something of a movement happening. We were just recently at, at NISOG, and um, you've seen the report, uh, you were there. There is a movement, it seems, in the U.S. and internationally, doing some of the similar sort of work that you're doing in the name of justice. Um, why now, and, and do you think it's a movement? In the, in the 20 years that I've been farming, the landscape has really shifted. Yeah. You know, if when I started out, there were very few black and brown folks who were part of what we're now calling the returning generation, people whose grandparents fled the red clays of Georgia to the paved streets of Pittsburgh and Chicago. There's this sense now in our communities that we left a piece of our souls behind. And there's something aching, something missing that we can't quite name, right? That's forgotten. And, and there's a clamor now, you know, folks are like, where, how, how do I get involved? How do I find out? How do I get back to the land? And I noticed too, even in white-led farming spaces, there's 
a wake up call in terms of the need for an equity framework. Mm -hmm. And so, so conferences that were before all white or boards that were all white are reaching out now and saying, how do we really rethink this so we center indigenous and black people in this narrative? It's interesting where I feel myself in entering your work is around that issue of where are our lines of struggle? Yeah. Uh, if they were perhaps around the law or they were around the workplace or they were around housing segregation, um, they have now become for many of us, I think, around our lives, around the, yeah. the, the, the quality of life that we are living. And at the, the, the working group on Northeast Sustainable Agriculture, a lot of people talked about hunger, yeah. not just as what you, where you started about getting food, but as a more sort of spiritual thing. I mean, I love talking about that. You know, folks probably know by now, if you, if you watch TED Talks, that trees talk to each other. Right. So Grandma Pine, would not be so tall if it wasn't for her friend mycelium, the fungus. And so she said to mycelium one day, you know, let's make a deal. I photosynthesize, I can make sugars and you can't. And you have acids that break down rocks into liquid mineral and I can't do that. So how about I make my roots porous and we enter into this symbiosis where we share and exchange. And so there's this amazing network in the forest mm -hmm. of collaboration of mutual aid. And my personal belief is that when you have bare feet on the soil or you have bare hand on the trees, that you get some messages about what it is to be more fully human, what it is to be in sacred community. So I completely agree with you that we are hungry. We are hungry people. Well, I'm hungry for more from you and I hope that we will get up to the farm again soon. Thank you so much for Thank the book, you. for your work. My pleasure. And if you want to see our original piece on Soul Fire Farm, you can in our archives. And in case you've been racking your brain about who Leah reminds you of, it's Naima, her sister, <laughs> who is one half of Climbing Poetry. So you can check out her work too. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.